So today we're going to look at lecture 12. This is going to look at the eukaryotes. So with eukaryotes, their reproduction can be asexual. They can do binary fission, budding, fragmentation, spore forming, schizogony, or sexual reproduction. There's a lot more variations out there. What they are capable of is that nuclear division where you have a haploid cell that's going to have a single copy of each of the chromosomes. Or you can have your diploid cell where you're going to have two sets of each chromosomes. So there's lots of variations in here. Mitosis is your asexual division. This is the division of the nucleus. There are four main phases to this. With prophase, you're going to form the chromosome. Your nuclear envelope is going to disintegrate. And you're going to start to form the mitotic spindle. In metaphase, your chromosomes align along the mitotic spindle. In anaphase, your chromatids are going to begin to separate. And then finally, in telophase, you're going to make a new nuclear envelope. Your chromosomes are going to unwind. And you go back to having two new daughter cells here. So there are several video animations in here that I recommend watching. There's one here on mitosis. With meiosis, you're going to have a nuclear division where you're going to divide the chromosomes and you're going to reduce the number of chromosomes. So here you're going to divide the nucleus into four nuclei. Each one will be haploid. This is how we do sexual reproduction. So in prophase one, this is you're going to do your early pairing of the homologous chromosomes. Later on in prophase one, you're going to have crossing over, where you're going to have some of the genetic information switch which chromosome it's on. Metaphase one, you're going to have the chromosome tetrads aligned. They're going to align along the metaphase plate. In anaphase one, your chromosome tetrads are going to separate. And in telophase one, you end up with two diploid cells. So. In prophase two, you're going to have the nuclear envelope gone and you make a new mitotic spindle. Metaphase two, the chromosomes align. Anaphase two, the sister chromatids are going to separate. And in telophase two, your daughter nuclei are going to have four haploid cells. Mm -hmm. So here at the beginning, you're going to have an extra copy of things made and then you're going to divide them twice. The first time you are going to replicate the chromosome, the second time you don't replicate the chromosomes, and that's why you're going to have half the genetic information at the end in your four daughter nuclei. Cytokinesis is the division of the cytoplasm. It begins in anaphases and is completed in telophase in most cells. If this does not occur, it will produce multinucleocyte, multinucleate coenocytes. So here's a video animation of meiosis. Schizogony, this will occur when you have multiple mitoses that will form a multinucleate schizont. And then cytokinesis will occur that will produce numerous uninucleate daughter merozoites. This occurs in the plasmodium. So that will allow them to produce multiple daughter cells. And here is some videos on the malaria schizogony. Encystment will occur under certain adverse conditions. Here the cells may form cysts. This will allow them to survive outside the host. Your classification in the eukaryotes started by the observable traits, but now we're moving towards classification schemes that are based on genetic relatedness. Some of them are going to be the same as what we saw before. Sometimes they will be a little bit different. So your protozoa are eukaryotic cells that are unicellular and lack a cell wall. The distribution of these, they require a moist environment because they lack cell walls. If they're not in a moist environment, they'll desiccate. They will live in moist soil, sand, decaying matter. A few of them are pathogens. They can be critical members of the plankton. And you can see varieties in the kind and number of mitochondria in these. Their morphology is varied. Some of the ciliates are going to have two nuclei. Some will lack mitochondria. The trophozoite is the modal free-living form, your feeding stage. The cyst is going to have a thick capsule and be a low metabolism stage of the organism. For nutrition, most of them are chemoheterotrophic. For reproduction, most are asexual and will do binary fission, schizogony. 
Some will do sexual reproduction and become gametocytes. They will form, fuse to form zygotes. The ciliates reproduce sexually through conjugation. So looking at the classifications of protozoa, they were classed on locomotion, but that did not reflect the genetic relationships. So your pars parabosola lack mitochondria. They have a single nucleus and a parabasal body that's a Golgi body-like structure. Example would be the trichonympha that lives in termite guts and allows them to digest wood. Trichomonas lives in the human vagina. This is asymptomatic in females, but it can proliferate when the pH raises in the female. Severe inflammation can actually lead to sterility. Diplomonadia, these are going to have two nuclei and multiple flagella. These will include giardia. They can form resistant cysts. The microsporidia, that will have polar filaments. They're obligatory intracellular parasites and can cause disease in the immunocompromised. So this would be things like the nosioma and microsporidium. So here's some additional information on Giardia. If you do any type of backpacking, hiking, Giardia is in our water supply here, so you want to make sure that if you drink any water that you're safe about it, that it's filtered, or that it's been boiled an adequate amount of time. The euglenozoa have characteristics of both plants and animals. The euglenoids are photoautotrophic, unicellular with chlorophyll A and B, and carotene. They store foods as paramylon. They lack cell walls, flagella, and will form cysts. The kinetoplast, these have a single large mitochondrion. The kinetoplast is the region of mitochondrial DNA. Some of these are pathogens like the trypanosoma that causes African sleeping sickness and Chagas disease. So here's a little video clip on the trypanosomas. The alveolates, these are going to have small membrane-bound cavities called the alveoli. Includes the ciliates, which have cilia. They are covered or have a few tufts of them. All of them have two nuclei. One example is the vorticella that is going to use a whirlpool current to move food towards its mouth. So the valentinium, valentinium coli, is pathogenic. And then the didinium can phagocytize other protozoa. So here's an example, a video clip you can watch here that shows the vorticella in action. The apicomplexans, these have a complex of special intracellular organelles. All of these are pathogens. This includes the plasmodium species that will cause malaria, babesia that causes anemia, and the toxoplasma that causes toxoplasmosis. Dinoflagellates, these are unicellular. They have photosynthetic pigments and protective plates of silica. They lack histones, and they're found in freshwater and marine plankton. Many of them are bioluminescent. Others are red. So, for example, the red tide is a dinoflagellate that will make a neurotoxin that poisons humans that eat shellfish with high concentrations of dinoflagellates. Here's a couple more videos and links that you can look at if you're interested in those organisms. The amoebozoa, these have lobe-shaped pseudopodes and no shells. Your amoeba are protozoa that move and feed by pseudopodia. They lack mitochondria and divide by binary fission. So the radiolarians and foraminifera are amoeba with sheets of silica and calcium carbonate. There are pathogenic amoeba, the nigleria and acanthamoeba, also entamoeba. The nigleria and acanthamoeba are free living in water and, and can cause disease of the human eye or brain in those who swim in water containing them. They are found in a lot of water supplies and can be problematic, but it is pretty rare to see infections of the nigleria or acanthamoeba. The entamoeba, these always live in animals, and they can cause potentially fatal amoebic dysentery. The slime molds, these were formerly considered fungi. There's two types of them. You've got the plasmodial slime molds and your cellular slime molds. So they do differ from fungi. They lack cell walls. They're phagocytic rather than absorptive. So fungi, these are going to include molds, mushrooms, and yeasts. Some of their unique features, they, their cell walls have chitin. They're chemoheterotrophic, and they decompose dead organisms. So the mycorrhizae 
90% of all plants form these beneficial associations between the roots and the fungi. That's what a mycorrhizae is. It assists the plant in being able to absorb water and minerals. Dermatophytes are fungi that are going to only infect the epidermis, hair, nails, and they cause infections called dermatomycoses. They can secrete keratinase to degrade keratin, which is why they're so effective at infecting the skin, hair, and nails. Mycoses are fungal diseases of plants, animals, and humans. So when we look at the morphology of them, the thallus is the vegetative or non-reproductive body of a fungi. The morphology of that can be varied. The hyphae are long branch tubular filaments that you see in mold. The septate are when the hyphae are divided into cells by cross walls. They are septate. Aseptate are hyphae without cross walls. They could be multinucleate or coenocytic. When an organism is dimorphic, it produces two types of thalli. Your mycelium is a tangled mass of intertwined hyphae mold. So that's what you're going to see if you see mold on bread or cheese. And then the yeasts are non-filamentous unicellular fungi that are typically spherical, oval, and are widely distributed in nature. So when we look at the nutrition of the fungi, they are saprophytes or saprobes, which means they're going to absorb nutrients from the remnants of dead organisms. The Haustoria are modified hyphae. This is going to be what penetrates the tissues to withdraw the nutrients from living plants or animals. It will actually go back further than you see. So if you have a block of cheese and you cut off the moldy section, there's still going to be some of the Haustoria that are penetrating back into the cheese or the bread that you've cut the moldy section off of. So nutritional adaptations that we see in the fungi, they usually grow better in a pH of about 5. Almost all molds are aerobic. Most yeasts are facultative anaerobes. They're more resistant to osmotic pressure changes than bacteria, so they can grow on relatively high concentrations of sugar and salt. They grow on less moisture than bacteria in general. They tend to require less nitrogen, and they can often metabolize more complex carbohydrates, things like lignin. So you've seen molds grow into walls and carpets. They can actually digest those things where most other things can't. So their reproduction, budding and asexual. Yeast bud similar to prokaryotic budding. In some of the species, like the Candida albicans, you can have series of buds that can be re You would see the budding in the Candida albicans. You can see series of buds that remain attached to make pseudohyphae in some species as well. So we can categorize the asexual spores of molds based on their shape. The sporangiospores are going to form a sac-like sporangium. Chlamydia spores are going to form thickened walls inside the hyphae. And the conidiospores will be produced at the tip or the sides of the hyphae, but not within a sac. There are many types of conidia, so those can be classified too. We have arthroconidia, blastoconidia, and conidiophores. The conidia develop in chains on the stalks called the conidiophores. So with sexual spore formation, we designate them as positive and minus, not as male as female. With plasmogamy, you have haploid cells that are going to form a positive and negative thallus to fuse and form a dicaryon. We refer to this as an N plus N cell. In karyogamy, your two nuclei are going to fuse to form one 2N nucleus. Then during meiosis, you'll have the 2N nucleus that will be restored to the haploid state, and then it will be partitioned into positive and negative spores. With the classes of fungi, there's four major subgroups. Three are divisions equivalent to phyla in other kingdoms based on the type of sexual spore produced. So we have the zygomycota, ascomycota, and basidiomycota. The fourth is the deuteromycota, which was an abandoned repository of fungi with no sexual stage. So the division zygomycota, these will include your coenocytic molds. There's about 1,100 species we've identified. The zygomycetes is going to have asexual reproduction with via sporangiospores. It will form sexual zygosporangia that will develop from sexually compatible hyphae tips. 
An example of this is the rhizopus, which is a bread mold. The microsporidia, they used to think these were protozoa. They're obligatory intracellular parasites. An example, the nosema is a parasite on insects like silkworms and honeybees. The division Ascomycota has about 32,000 species we've identified. They're going to include molds and yeast. Many of these will partner with green algae or cyanobacteria to form lichens. Your ascospores, these are haploid and form within sacs that are called asci in fruiting bodies. The fruiting bodies are going to be the ascocarps, and they will reproduce asexually by conidiospores. These can spoil food, they're plant pathogens, things like Caviceps purpurea that grows on grain, it's also known as ergot, can cause abortions in cattle and produces hallucinogenic LSD, penicillium mold, sarcomyces that ferments sugar to ethanol, truffles, and then the neurospora, which is pink bread mold. In the division Basidiomycota, these are 22,000 known species. Here you've got the basidiocarps. The fruiting body is there, a tightly woven hyphae that will extend into club-shaped basidia that will produce sexual basidiospores. They're decomposers, they're hallucinatory, they're the rusts and smuts that will affect crops. An example is the amanita, which is the death cap mushroom. Cryptococcus neoformans, which is a pathogen that can cause meningitis. And then the psilocybe cubensis that produces psilocybin, which is a hallucinogen. The deuteromycetes, here the sexual stages are unknown. It's a new classification with the ribosomal RNA determined. Most in this category actually belong to the ascomycota, but it may still be used by some. So this does include several pathogens like trichophyton, which is ringworm. So here's some information linking to the deuteromycetes. So lichens are partnerships between fungi and photosynthetic microbes. Here you have the hyphae of the fungi, fungus, which is usually an ascomycota, that surrounds photosynthetic cells and provides nutrients, water, and protection from desiccation or harsh light. The fungal hyphae project below to form rhizines or holdfasts. The algae or cyanobacteria are going to provide the fungus carbohydrate and oxygen from photosynthesis. In some lichens, the phototroph releases 60% of the carbohydrate to the lichen. Not all are mutually beneficial. There's about 14,000 species of lichens in three shapes. So when we look at their shapes, the crustose grow oppressed to a substrate, and they may extend into the substrate several millimeters. The froleos are more leaf-like. Their margins will grow free of the substrate. And the fruticos can grow erect or in hanging cylinders. They're going to be elevated off of the substrate. So here's some videos and websites on lichens if you are interested. The algae are simple eukaryotic photoautotrophic organisms. They have sexual reproductive structures in which every cell becomes a gamete, and these include several phyla. Phycology is the study of algae. The distribution of these, most are aquatic in the photic zone but they do have some in diverse habitats. They must have accessory photosynthetic pigments to trap the short, short wavelength of light in the deeper water. Phycoerythrin is a red pigment in red algae. So their morphology, they're unicellular or colonial, simple multicellular bodies called thalli. They can be in branch filaments or sheets. Some have pneumocyst gas bubbles to float. You can have your larger multicellular algae, algae, they're commonly called seaweeds, and they'll have branch hold fast to anchor. They can be stem-like and often have hollow stipes and leaf-like blades. The reproduction for the unicellular, they can do asexual reproduction with mitosis and cytokinesis, and then sexual with the gametes fusing to form a zygoid, and then do meiosis. The multicellular ones will do asexual bifragmentation and spores. And in sexual reproduction, every cell becomes a gamete. Here you can see the alternation of generations with haploid and diploid cells. So here's a couple of links to get a little more information on algae.
So the classification of algae is not yet settled. Right now it's by the color of the photosynthetic pigment. So in the division chlorophyta, these are the green algae. They have a lot of similarities to plants. They'll have chlorophyll A and B, sugar and starch reserves. A lot of them have cellulose walls. They were placed in the kingdom plantae in some taxonomic schemes. They can be unicellular or multicellular, freshwater or marine. Some examples would be the Protheca, Codium, and Trevoxia. Again, more links if you're interested to each of these types of algae. The kingdom Rhodophyta are the red algae. They have the red pigment phycoerythrin. They can store glycogen as fluoridine. They have starch in the walls. These can be used in agar or carrageenan. Those are sometimes used in the food industry. They range in color. The male gametes have non-modal spermatia. Most are marine. Some are freshwater. It includes the chondrus and gelidium. These are used as thickening agents in microbiological microbiological media. So when you're using auger, it's used some of the red algae to thicken them. And then they're used in some other consumer products. Phaeophyta, these are going to be your brown algae. They're in the kingdom Staminophila. They have chlorophyll A and C and carotene. And then brown pigment Xanthophytus. Most of these are marine. They can have gametes and spores that are modal. They'll use the polysaccharide laminarin and oils as food reserves. Their walls have cellulose and alginate and this can also be used as a thickener in food. So your chrysophyta are the golden algae or yellow green algae and diatoms. They all have more carotene than chlorophyll. They use the polysaccharide chrysalominarin as a food storage product. They have diverse walls and pigments. Some lack walls. Some have ornate coverings. The diatoms have two frustules that fit together like petri dishes. They're a component of plankton. Also used in polishing compounds, gardens, and detergents. So if you get diatomaceous earth, it's going to have diatoms in it. The water molds, or the oomycota, are not true fungi. They're in the kingdom Straminopola. The water molds are tubular cristae, have tubular cristae in the mitochondria. They also have cellulose walls, two flagella, a true diploid thalli, and they can decompose dead animals. They may damage crops, so the phytophora kills potato crops. So there are other eukaryotes that are related to microbiology. The helminths are the parasitic worms. So they can be quite large, but they do have microscopic infective and diagnostic stages. So most of them are the platyhelminthes or nematodes. Platyhelminthes are the flatworms. So the first group are the trematodes or flukes. They're flat, leaf-shaped bodies with a ventral sucker and an oral sucker. This includes Clonorchis sinensis, which is the Asian liver fluke, the Paragonimus species that live in the lungs. Your cestodes are the tapeworms. With their body, their scolex is the head that's going to have suckers on it. And then the proglottids are the segments. And they're going to have both male and female parts in them. So an example, Tania saginata, that's the beef tapeworm. And Tania solia, which is the pork tapeworm. So the nematodes are roundworms. These actually have complete digestive systems. The Ascaris lumbricoides is large. It can be 30 centimeters in length. And this adult lives exclusively in human small intestines. The Bayless Ascaris pyrocyanus is the raccoon roundworm. It can also live in domestic dogs. Trichuris trichiera is a whipworm. This one can be spread person to person through fecal oral spread or fecal contamination in food. Anaerobius vermicularis. This is pinworm. This spends its entire life in humans. This one's very common in toddlers, daycares. Here the female deposits the eggs on the perianal skin. It will cause itching. Toddler just goes for it and itches it, gets it underneath the fingernails, and a lot of times put their hands in their mouth or somebody else's mouth to spread the infection. The Strongyloides species, these have larvae that live in the soil and they can penetrate the skin. The Nicator americanus and Encyclostoma duodenale are hookworms. 
Here the adults live in the small intestine. They can actually penetrate through the skin when they are larvae. The trichinella, this can be insisted in undercooked meat and then consumed. The dinoflaria imitis, this is heartworm in dogs. So here's some more information that are some links to the helminths. So the arthropods, these can serve as vectors. They're animals with segmented bodies. They have hard exoskeletons, jointed legs, and they can carry pathogens. Some are mechanical vectors, so they're just merely going to carry the pathogens. Others are biological vectors that will also serve as hosts. Your arachnids, these have eight legs. They include ticks and mites that are vectors. Spiders do not actually transmit diseases normally, so they may serve as a mechanical vector by accident, but they are not biological vectors. Insects, they have three pairs of legs, a head, thorax, and abdomen. They are the greatest number of vectors. With flight, they have a broader home range. They're much harder to control. It includes things like fleas, lice, flies, flies, true bugs, and mosquitoes. So here's a couple of links on the insects.